Hi, I'm Bonnie Rush. I'm the HOTUS Family Dean of the College of Veterinary Medicine, and I'm your moderator today for the eighth installment of the diagnostic webinar. And the only reason I'm the moderator is because our very special guest today is Dr. Greg Hanslicek, the typical moderator. And I really shouldn't have agreed to be moderator on a day when he was going to be in the room. It was really just poor planning on, on my part because he can judge my ability to serve as moderator. Uh, just a few logistic uh, things before we get through to the content. If you if you stay with us the entire 45-minute uh, presentation, uh, you'll receive a CE certificate by email within the next two weeks. If you watch us on our CE page, uh, there'll be a quiz at the end, and you will get a CE certificate. If you watch us on our YouTube channel, you won't get any CE credit. So. Let's hope you can stay with us for the whole hour and get your CE credit. At the end, there'll be a survey where you'll be able to ask for uh, new topics, different topics you'd like to see in the future. So all of the topics that have been selected for these webinars have come from you, uh, your requests. So please send us new ideas. If you wanna put them in the chat, you can do that as well. So our special guest today is Dr. Greg Hanslicek, and he is a Mississippi State grad I'm not sure the year is important, uh, but he did uh, he did come to K-State and got his PhD, and now he is the Associate Director of the Kansas Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory. He's the Director of our uh, Field Investigation Unit, and he's just been promoted to full professor. And today he's going to talk to us about Yonis, but before we get to the content, we got a pretty important football game coming up in about 11 days. So this is the audience participation part as well. Please put your answers in the chat. Dr. Hanslicek, who's your favorite chief? Pacheco, by far. Please tell us more. Uh, he's hard-nosed. He, every play is 100%. Uh, he never gives up. He's just he's just there all the time, and he's just he's a blast to watch. I'd hate to try to tackle him, but he's a blast to watch. He is amazing. <clears throat> They're all amazing, and and I really you know I wish the NFL was a little bit. Um, more creative with their with their MVPs because they always just give it to the winning quarterback. But really, I thought the Chiefs defense, the entire defense, especially Snead and, and Chris Jones, deserve some recognition. So if I were picking an MVP uh, for, for Sunday's game, I would have picked the defense, clearly. There's probably somebody in the audience that said Taylor Swift. As They're their probably, favorite, favorite I don't know chief. about our audience, if anybody <laughs> said Taylor Swift, but lots of people believe Taylor Swift is... Uh, is a player for the Chiefs. That's that's true. Okay. Are you we're gonna we're gonna do questions at the end, but put them in the chat. And yep. Greg, tell us all there is new to know about Yoni's disease. Thanks, Dean Rush, for being the moderator and for being here today. Um, I hope we can uh, actually have you as the permanent moderator every other month, but I know <laughs> that probably won't happen. But uh, one of the questions that I got from my colleagues. When we said we we're going to do one on Yonis, it was uh, why. And one of the reasons is because uh, every survey that you all have filled out after the webinars, there's always been multiple people that said, uh, can you give us an update on Yonis? And and another question was, is there really anything new about Yonis? And, and frankly, for practitioners that are participating today, there's not a ton of stuff that's new. There's a, there's a few things that are. Uh, particularly on the diagnostic side. And then when we talk about shedding patterns for animals. Um, but for me, the reason I want to present Yoni's is I have a particular interest in it, but uh, we're seeing more and more cow-calf operations that are positive for Yoni's than we did five, 10 years ago. Uh, some of that might, might be because they're testing more, but I don't think so. I think we're just, uh, the disease has spread, it's been insidious, it's in more herds and, and uh, one of my things I'd like to go over today is is the need to try to get a handle on this disease. And one of the reasons why, in my opinion, we need to is the zoonotic drumbeat for this disease, this MAP organism, uh, and zoonotic for humans for multiple diseases is extremely loud. And in fact, for one of the diseases, uh, some MDs have made it, made it from an association to a causation. And we'll talk a little bit about the zoonotic at the end. So those are the reasons why we, we chose Yonis and, and uh, why we're gonna talk about it today. So again, a lot of this is gonna be review, uh, but it's always good to review occasionally. So 
What is Yoni's? Uh, it's a malabsorption disease and it's chronic and incurable. We, we have no chemicals in the United States to treat Yoni's cows. There are countries where they, they are available at times, uh, at least experimentally. Uh, this is a, a national survey that was completed by NOMS back in 2017 and they asked it represents between 83 and 86 percent of the cow calf producers and they asked them what do you know how familiar are you with yonis and in the red box that 70 percent said they either did have never heard of it or they did they just recognize the name and you know we've done a really good job to uh, educate uh, producers on bvd now anaplast trichomonas uh, some of those diseases but we really haven't talked much about Yoni's disease in the cow-calf industry, certainly not like we have on the dairy side. So uh, another reason why I kind of want to do this today. It's an infectious agent uh, that, that's a bacteria, mycobacterium avium, subspecies, paratuberculosis. So for uh, obvious reasons, we it's, you'll see it written and we'll just call it MAP. Uh, it was discovered back in the 1800s by Alfred Yoni, who's a veterinarian in Germany. And that's where the name comes from. You'll hear people Call it John's, Johnny's. Uh, we have a, a rancher that's actually on a uh, Yoni's control program, and he, for the last two years, he, he calls it Yonkers. Uh, and so around him, it's Yonkers disease. Everybody else, it's Yoni's disease. But that's where the name came from. It was first discovered in a Guernsey milk cow uh, in Pennsylvania back in, in 1908. So it's been here for a very, very long time. Species that are affected, just when you hear Yoni's, just think, Ruminants and pseudoruminants, that's basically the, the natural carriers and infectious uh, species uh, for this particular organism. Some monogastrics can carry it, but it's particularly in experimental uh, models where they use high, high doses and it's, it's probably not all that realistic. We can break uh, Yoni's disease out into actually three types. Uh, the cattle type is type 2 or type C, so that's predominantly the one that we see in cattle. We can't see sheep and goats. Uh, they can have this type C there, but they are particularly the type one or type S, uh, but cattle can also carry type S. And the thing about this is we don't really need to get wrapped up into, into the types here because at least clinically within a species, it doesn't really matter whether it's a type one or type two, they're, they're gonna present the same. Certainly Yoni's presents differently between small ruminants and cattle, uh, but they can have any of these. And then type three, which is B, it is actually a subtype of type one. That's where we see it in, in our American bison and, and water buffalo and those. So that's just kind of a, a break breakdown of the, the genome of the MAP organism. Production impacts, I think everybody's aware of these, and this is uh, information that comes from the dairy side particularly, but uh, because it's a malabsorption disease and these animals are not absorbing the nutrients out of their diet as they should, uh, decreased milk production. And because the, the bovine immune system is, is just a hog for energy and protein, if they're not on a good plane of nutrition, uh, obviously their, their immune system is not going to be functioning well and they're going to be uh, predisposed to other diseases. And then because they're not producing as well as they should and that they're predisposed to other diseases, they typically leave the herd earlier. And again, this is dairy, but I don't know why we would think that this would be any different on a, on a cow-calf operation. Um, we just haven't had an opportunity to measure it. Let's talk a little bit about the infection and the clinical signs. One of the major concepts about this disease is that calves the first six months of age are at the highest risk for infection. Some people put it up to a year, uh, but it's, that's why we concentrate on preventing the infection in our, in our young calves on our cow-calf operations. It's dose dependent, so if we have a high enough dose, we could infect adult cows, but for most places, the, that dosage is not high enough. We typically don't even think too much about the transmission between adults. It's the transmission is between adults to baby calves in their first six months of age. Modes of infection, this is an oral oral disease. Uh, and I've got feces down there with the stars on them. And on the cow-calf side, uh, fecal oral transmission is the one we're concerned about. If we have cows out there that are uh, shedding this disease in the organism in the feces, 
those young calves uh, can have access to it. They can get it on themselves. They can self-groom. Anytime they ingest it, that's where we get the infection. Uh, if we've got a, a mother, uh, cow or heifer, that's uh, infected and she's in the later stages of the disease, then she can pass it also in the colostrum and milk, and she can pass it transplacentally. Not all positive uh, Yoni's animals will be shedders. Uh, it's typically those that are getting to the later stages of the disease. And now just in the last, I don't know, year or two years, uh, there's some research out there that suggests that in environments where there's a lot of this MAP organism, that it can actually be transmitted by aerosol. And that's even on the zoonotic side where they, they're thinking that humans that are around dust and dirt that has this MAP organism that they can become infected that way. So that's a, another potential source of infection. And the transplacental, this is done by Whittington. He's actually done some tremendous work in, in Yonis. Uh, his estimates are 9% of the subclinical dams will pass it transplacentally and 39% of the clinical. Uh, again, all of these animals, all these, you know, say this several times, they're not gonna necessarily go through all the stages. Some of these cows, in fact, a lot of them will keep this uh, disease in check. And so they will never get to the point where they're actually shedding or passing the organism on to, to their uh, offspring or others. Incubation period, even though the, <clears throat> the time of infection is the first six months of life, uh, the median age when we see clinical signs is five years of age. But that is, that is dose dependent. So the larger the dose, that the, the calf, the first six months of age ingests, the earlier they have the opportunity to become clinical. And that makes sense. The more organisms we have localized in the ILM, we'll talk more about that later, uh, the sooner that they're gonna start showing clinical signs. And uh, since I've been here at KSVDL, we've had a dairy case and a beef case where we were seeing one and a half to two year old heifers uh, break with clinical yonis. And when we investigated and looked at the environment, uh, these these calves were born in an environment that was just uh, super contaminated with this MAP organism, and they were just ingesting a, a very large amount of organisms shortly after birth. Clinical signs, I think anybody that's been around Yonis understands uh, what the clinical signs are. Chronic diarrhea, um, normal appetite, and afebrile. So if, if we have an adult bovine that has those three signs, chronic diarrhea, normal appetite, and afebrile, we have to put yonis at the very top of the list. There are very few uh, diseases that'll, that'll prevent like that. A very small percentage of these cows might, their, their uh, stools might firm up and then they go back to diarrhea, but the vast majority, once they start having diarrhea, they're, they're gonna continue. And the bottom left there, that's a classical uh, yonis uh, shedder manure. It's, it's got that green tinge to it. Some people call it pea green. Uh, I don't like to use that, but it's pea soup green is what they call it. It's got a lot of bubbles in it. Uh, veterinarians that have been around a lot of yonis, they, they can basically spot a yonis cow by just looking at the manure. Um, the fact that these cows, they're, it's malabsorption, they're not absorbing the, the protein out of the diet. So the protein's in the, in the lumen of the ileum and it's pulling water uh, through the wall through osmosis. And that, that explains the diarrhea. But it also, uh, that's why we see this bottle jaw down here. These animals are, are very low. If you look at their blood chemistries, their albumin levels are extremely, extremely low. And then again, because it's a, a malabsorption disease, eventually these cows will start losing uh, tremendous weight. And again, they could be on the greatest plane of nutrition. A lot of them just eat normally, but they're just, uh, everything's going out the back end. All the good, good nutrients are not being absorbed. And here's some other clinical signs, and this would be uh, obviously post-mortem. So if we take a, a section of the ileum and we incise it and then uh, flatten it out on a, on a surface, that's what a, a normal one looks like. It's very thin, very smooth. These two pictures at the top here are classical, uh, end-stage Yoni's cows that died. And what happens is this organism, we talk about the pathogenesis a little later, when it uh, invades the ileum, it causes a chronic inflammation. And through that inflammation, then we have a thickening of the bowel wall. And as the bowel wall thickens, then it can't absorb the nutrients out of the, out of the lumen. And that's where we get the, the malabsorption. 
the bottom two uh, photos, the one on the left, there's a, a histo slide showing the organisms, and then the, the one on the right's a, a, an actual uh, culture with a, a stain. And if we take uh, endoscopically, if you take an endoscope and, and go down and look and look in the in the ileum, this uh, normal ones at the top right, but you can see on the bottom, this would be a an end stage cow where the bowel is completely thickened and it's folded. Uh, call it corrugated gut is what some people call it because it it kind of looks like the inside layer, the the layer on a corrugated box between the two flat layers. Uh, but that's typically what it what it looks like for end stage. Uh, we we put these animals with yonis through, they go through four stages. Uh, stage one is initial infection, then we have a silent carrier stage, and then we can go into clinical signs, and then they, stage four is, is the final stage. And I, I really want to enforce here that most cows will not transition out of stage two. They will hold this organism in check. They will not advance to clinical signs. They will not advance to being shedders. And so just because a cow is positive for yonis doesn't necessarily mean that this animal needs to leave the herd. They're not putting anybody at risk uh, just as, as being a carrier. So, but those that do, that's the typical four stages that they'll, they'll transmit through. Prevalence, uh, the last studies that I know of, which were done a long time ago, only said 22% of the dairies and 8% of the beef herds are infected. I think uh, a lot of us believe those numbers are way, way, way too low. It'd be nice if we could repeat that, especially on the on the cow-calf side. Um, certainly think that it, that's probably higher than that. Texas, they did a cool study. They looked at 115 purebred beef herds, and they found that 44% of those herds had at least one positive animal. And we do see, we do see a lot of purebred beef bulls as they're purchased and, and brought into operations where they become clinical in a year or two. And so we have to just assume that, that they were actually infected at, at where they were raised and where they were bred. So uh, Georgia, they looked at over 5,000 uh, serum samples from uh, cell barn cows and 4% of their samples were positive. So pretty high prevalence rates. If we look at results, and this isn't a true prevalence, but results coming out of our lab uh, for the last four years, uh, each county that has a cow on there just represents a county where we received at least one positive Yoni's test. A lot of these counties, there's multiple herds that are infected. Uh, we're certainly not saying, you know, it's not in these, we're not saying it's not in Smith or Jewel or any of these without a cow. We just haven't received a positive sample from there. So uh, whether it's everywhere, we don't know. Uh, most of us believe it probably is, uh, at least in every county. Certainly not in every herd, but uh, probably in every county. Pathogenesis, uh, it's a, at least for me, it's really a fascinating organism and in, in what happens in the, in the cow, uh, calf, when, it, when they actually become infected. So if we just look at this drawing, we've got the, the lumen of the ileum here and we've got the MAP organisms and these dendritic cells and these M or microfold cells, they help the MAP organism uh, go from the lumen into the circulation. And as soon as they're in the circulation and the lymphatics, the macrophages are going to attack them and engulf them. And that's where these organisms like to live. So that, that's good for them. Uh, the cow's gonna, or the calf's gonna start a Th1 cell mediated uh, immune response immediately. And then there's gonna be a delay where a Th2 response is gonna occur. So it, it's kind of a really neat dynamic that occurs there. If we look at the, the actual sequence of events, we get up uh, ingestion, they're now in the lymphatics and the bloodstream. Again, they're in the macrophages. These organisms are obligate intercellular uh, organisms. So they, they want it and they have to live inside a cell and they do like the macrophages. And in fact, they, they change the way that these macrophages actually work. They inhibit their calling out to other white blood cells to, hey, we've got a, an infection or an inflammation. So they down, they down regulate the, the ability of these macrophages to actually initiate more immune response. Um, they also, uh, they reduce the, or they actually extend the life cycle of the macrophage. So every cell has a planned cell death period called apoptosis. Uh, and these, 
these uh, BAP cells actually will extend the life of the macrophages because they, they want to continue to live inside the cell. Uh, and they keep re reproducing and they get to a point where they, they've replicated so much that they actually burst the cell wall of these macrophages and then they're disseminated through the other parts of the body. But the MAP organisms don't like that because then they're exposed to other parts of the immune system. So they want to stay in these white blood cells. Uh, that's where they like to live and, uh, and that causes part of the problem. So it's, it's really a, a very dynamic, very, very interesting little uh, thing they do. What other uh, organs can we find this in? We talked about the ileum as the primary site for this uh, disease. The, the jejunum also can be a site, but we can find it in the spleen, the liver, uterus, find it in semen. Uh, we can find it certainly in, in the lymph nodes. So again, when those macrophages burst, uh, these organisms are disseminated in a lot of different body organs. Diagnostics, a uh, part I really wanted to get to today is uh, on this, the left-hand column there is all the available tests that can be used to uh, diagnose uh, Yoni's disease. And I, I highlighted the serum elice and the fecal PCR because that is, those are the, true, the two tests that we're gonna primarily use to manage this disease on a herd basis. And it, it shows you the stage of disease when they're positive, uh, estimated sensitivity, We'll go through a little bit of this and specificity. So again, it's these two. Some of these others are used on on case to case basis. So some of the challenges that occur with diagnostics is uh, we can't. It's very difficult to identify animals early stage uh, infected, and we typically say we're not going to start testing animals till they're at least three years of age, and. That's in, if they're in high prevalence herds where they're exposed to a lot of organisms uh, in the initial infection, they're likely to become clinical earlier. We're also able to find them earlier with, with these diagnostics. But for most herds, we're going to say we don't, there's no reason to test animals under three. Uh, let's wait until they're th that age. And that, that causes a, a major problem. Uh, we actually have a company from Europe that has designed a a new technology that they believe that uh, they can identify animals very, very early through blood samples that are that are Yoni's infected. And we're in the diagnostic lab, we're very excited about working with them because that would really help us uh, actually monitor and manage this disease. Some of the other challenges is we don't really have a good gold standard for, for Yoni's disease or MAP. Uh, and our, so we really don't know what the sensitivity is of these tests, but our best uh, kind of estimation is anywhere from 40 to 67 percent. So you can see that we miss 60 to 30 percent of the positives. So uh, false negatives are common. Uh, I just look at it as uh, for most herds, uh, normal prevalence, they have about a 50 percent sensitivity. So if we sampled 100 cows and we had two that were actually positive, we could just say we probably have two more. We've got four, and then we'd probably want to come back and test those negatives later to make sure that we didn't miss them. Uh, the sensitivity of this test, because it is a chronic disease, does increase as prevalence increases. So if we have high prevalence herds, it performs better than it does it in herds that with very, very low uh, prevalence. And then specificity, the, fa the false positives. Um, the PCR is almost 100%. It, it's very, very accurate. Uh, yeah, Lysa might have some some issues with specificity. Uh, the company that makes our our kits tells us that's probably not true, uh, but we'll talk about why why we might have some false positives for for at least our lysis. And our lysis sample serum, obviously, uh, and typically a cow will become serum positive later than they are po P PCR positive. How long that that distance is, or how time. We don't know, but typically that's the case. They'll become PCR positive before they're serum positive. And then we, we do know that there's non-pathogenic environmental mycobacterium that can trigger the ELISA to look positive. Again, the company that makes our kits says that that's pretty rare. Uh, but the thing that we do know is that uh, herds that are TB testing with the comparative cervical test, that test will interfere with the ELISA for 30 to 69 days post-injection. So 
for herds that are on a TB testing uh, regimen, uh, taking the sample before they do the test is, is really important if they're going to use the ELISA. Here's a, a, just a screenshot of results that came out of our lab. Uh, for the ELISA, there's animal ID, and then ELISA is going to report out a negative, positive, or suspect. And then it's going to give this SP ratio. And the SP, this is the way the SP is, is calculated. It's just optical densities of the sample with the controls. But for this test, anything at or above 0.55 is positive. And the reason I, I really like this test and the fact that we actually give people an SP ratio is that some really interesting work done by Michael Collins when he was at the University of Wisconsin. He followed hundreds, if not thousands of cows over 20, 25 years. And what he did, he would uh, consistently take a serum sample and then a fecal sample and, and run either a fecal culture or fecal PCR. And what he was wanting to do is, was to say, can we look at the ELISA SP and determine whether these animals are shedding? And he actually came up with a number that we use that has been very, very helpful uh, to, to determine the disease state of these cows. And so here's the results from our uh, just the last 43,000 tests that we did. These are the SPs down here in the horizontal thing. And I just bring this out is that values that three or four or above are very, very rare. So uh, Dr. Collins said anything that's a one or above is probably shedding. So that would be the, these are the percentage of the samples that we got from uh, cow-calf operations that were actually positive. Uh, that, and we'd call them those... Uh, animals actually shedding the disease. And if we, this is the way that we use it, is that we break them out as negative, low positive, moderate positive, and then high positives. And here's, here's the way, the reason I like it is because we can manage individual cows by using the SP ratio. So obviously if they're negative, they're high probability, they're not infected, they're more, they're not infectious, and we really don't need to do anything with those cows. If they're in that 0.56 to 0.77, they're probably infected, but again, they're still not likely infectious. And so what we what we recommend is just keep those animals that they're valuable. And next year before calving, we're gonna retest them again to make sure that they, they stayed in this category. If they're a little higher, this 0.78 to 0.99, they're very high probability they're infected. They might be infectious, they might be shedding. I don't know that for sure, but typically what we're gonna say is that that's one strike against her. So if she's got another reason why she might need to be cold, say production's not what it should be, or she's three quartered or whatever, uh, this would be another reason, another strike against her. But the ones we really concentrate on are those that are above one, one and above. These animals need to be found before calving season starts and they need to be segregated uh, away from the calving herd, or they need to be cold, uh, because these are the ones that are the shedders. And again, on the cow-calf operation, fecal oral is, is the mode of infection. So we need to keep these animals away from our baby calves. Uh, some people promote the, the idea if we have a one or above, we need to actually cull this cow's last calf because she probably passed the organism off to that calf through the milk or through the uterus or, or through the colostrum. Uh, we do recommend that, but sometimes we just say, if that calf's valuable, let's just start testing her or him at two years of age and then do it every year for the next three years. And that, that will give us a chance to find, find them if they're positive and then do something with them before they, they actually start shedding. So I, I just think it's the only ELISA I know that actually allows you to use a number to give a prognosis and, and, and manage individual animals. So um, I think it's pretty cool. Here's, a, and this just kind of reinforces what Colin said. So this, this producer took blood samples and then fecal samples from the same cows and submitted them to us for testing. And here's the SP ratio. So there's three that are over one. So we'd look at those and say, okay, they're, those are very high and they're probably shedding. If we go down and look at the PCR, it matches up perfectly. They are shedding. Now, does that happen every time? We don't do a lot of this uh, two testing on the same animal at the same time. Uh, and would it, ha would it match up perfectly? No, it wouldn't. We'd have some discordant results. There, 
there's no doubt, but this, this kind of, at least to me, helps reinforce what Dr. Collins uh, came up with all his years of research. PCR, there's some challenges there, and, and the sample for that's feces. Uh, back in the day, not too long ago, we, we were looking at results, uh, research that was done on, envi on experimentally infected cows. And from that research, it looked like these cows, once they start shedding, they'd go from levels of very high shedding to very low to very high, and they just, they called switching. They'd switch back from high to low, high to low, high to low. And one of the fears were, if we take a fecal sample looking for yonis, we may be sampling when they're at a very, very low level, and we, it's a false negative. Well, this uh, Dr. Mitchell at Pennsylvania has done some really cool yonis work. They looked at naturally infected cows, and what they came up with is less than 5% ever switched from a high level of shedding to a low sh level of shedding. So our, our angst about intermittent shedders is a lot less than it, than it was in the past, and, and it's kind of helped us have a little more faith in the, in the PCR. One of the things that we do have to be conscious of are what we call pass-through individuals. So these are cows that are living in an environment where they are in, they are ingesting the MAP organism through the feed or through the soil or the dust or whatever it could be, uh, but they're not infected. But if we do a fecal PCR, we're gonna, we're gonna, it's gonna look like they are. And so uh, we typically see that in herds where the environmental contamination is at a very high level. And we've had multiple cases of that uh, since I've been here in the D lab. So the way we look at those, and this is not, this is not 100%, it's not based on a whole bunch of science, but if we look at the cycle threshold hold here on the horizontal axis, if we have values of, that are above, in the 35s or above, these are animals where we might say, are these truly passed through animals? And, and if they're valuable and the owner wants to maybe not cull them, then those would be animals that we'd wanna retest down the road to see if they, if they are. Get them out of the environment or retest them with, with an ELISA. Those that are 30 or below, uh, that is such a large amount of this organism that it's hard to believe that their environment would be contaminated enough to actually set it down in, in the cycle threshold in the, in the 20s. So those we would consider to be true positive. So just a, a tool that we, we can use. Control and prevention, just real quick. There's three control strategies that are, that are primarily used. One is, is management. So, and on again, on the cow calf side, it's manure management. What we're trying to do is prevent the accumulation of adult manure uh, around baby calves in their first six months to, to year of life. We're just trying to prevent uh, those calves from being exposed to large amounts of this organism. And then the other part of that is, this is truly a, a purchase disease. And so how do we, what do we do to prevent the producer from purchasing animals that are, that are truly infectious? And remember, uh, we can only, we're only going to test animals that are three years of age and old, or older. And a lot of these bulls and things that come in are, are yearlings or long yearlings. So we don't really have a good way of testing them. Another strategy is to just test and cull. We're going to go through, use whatever test, the ELISA or the PCR, and uh, cull those animals that are positive. And then the third one is test and cull plus the management practices. So we're going to, we're going to use one and two together. And this is a, a simulation that was actually University of Wisconsin, they used on dairies, uh, but I think it's appropriate uh, for cow-calf operations also. So the horizontal axis are years, so five, 10, 15 years, and then the vertical axis is the percent of the herd that's, that's infected or prevalence. So if we've got a herd down here at the bottom of this red line, and at this point in time, they're about 1% of the herd is positive. And through time, you can see how it just continues to spread. After 15, close to 15 years, it's only up to 25. So it's, it's really an insidious infection spread through the herd, but that's at a pretty high level. And this is if we do no control program. If year nine, we decide, we, well, we better do a control program. Let's just pick test and cull. So that's this black line. So we test here and we get rid of all the positives. We reduce prevalence immediately, but it takes it, the decrease in prevalence is very, very slow. And even after 30 years, we, we're not to the level we were when we in, initiated the, the process. 
if we look at husbandry, we can lower prevalence quicker, but again, it's gonna take many, many years for us to get back to that, that 1%. If we use both, it's, it's really the best, best method to use. But again, we're talking over 15 years or over 10 years for, for us to get down to this level. So the point of this is that testing coal by itself is probably not a good recommendation for controlling yonis. We certainly wanna do husbandry uh, we have to have husbandry, but if we want to add coal, uh, testing coal on top of it, that, that's a plus. The other thing to take from this is that it's easy to purchase, but once it's in the herd and it's in its spread, it takes a very long time for us to get the herd back to where it was uh, before we brought the disease in. So again, it, it's, a, it's a purchase disease. Okay, so one of the questions is, well, do I have an infected herd or is this herd infected? And if it's been diagnosed in the past, then you can probably assume that yes, they are still infected. There's three ways to decide whether we have uh, diseased cows. Uh, I'll just start at the bottom here. This environmental sampling, we, we use it on dairies. We can't really use, it's not recommended for use on cow-calf operations uh, just because we don't have good sampling areas to sample compared to a dairy. Uh, another strategy is just test the whole herd. Well, that's very, very costly and, and a lot of producers do not want to do that. This one in the red is the one that we typically recommend. And this again comes from some of Dr. Collins's advice to us uh, back in the day, is that we just, we pick 10 to 20 of the oldest, thinnest cows in the herd, run an ELISA or do a pool PCR. And if they're negative, and we want to do that again the next year. And really, if you did it three years in a row and they were always negative, then you have a pretty good idea that uh, very high level of confidence that the prevalence is extremely low or they might even be negative. So this is kind of what we recommend to, to determine if the, actually the disease is there or not. One of the questions that, that might need to be answered is, well, if I'm diseased, then what percentage of my herd is diseased? So, uh, one of the things, the recommendations is you test everybody three years of age and older. Uh, it can be very, very costly. What we like to do, because we've got some epidemiologists and we like to push numbers, is uh, we like to do sample size calculations. So what we do is we say, okay, we need to know what we think the prevalence is in the herd, and then we need to know how precise uh, we need that estimate to be, and then we look at the, the size of the herd and then from that, we come up with a, a number that when we test those animals, it'll, it'll give us a good idea what the whole herd prevalence is. Rarely does the whole herd have to be tested unless they're very, very small. Usually it's a, it's a relatively small subset. So if you've got herds that you want to know the prevalence, this is, just give us a call. We'd be happy to, to work up the calculations for you. A part of the management, at least in my opinion, is <clears throat> for herds that uh, are conscious and they want to control yonis is that they should have a veterinarian conduct a yearly yonis risk assessment. And, and what this risk assessment does, it identifies those bottlenecks or those areas in the system that are providing the most opportunity for infection. And it's just a bunch of questions uh, that are answered. And then there's a value, a number value put by the, each answer and then at the end, everything's calculated up and it, and it shows where the gaps are. There's a couple ways veterinarians can do it. At the bottom there is just a screenshot of a, it's a PDF put out by the USDA. And again, it's just a bunch of questions that you can print out. You go visit the, the producer, you go through, look at the facility, answer the questions, and then again, add up the numbers. We like to use this app that was actually produced or made by uh, University of Wisconsin. It's exactly the same thing as the booklet. It's just in an, on an iPad. It costs $5. It's very cheap. And you just go through the questions, you put in your numbers, and then it, it automatically summarizes everything for you, puts in these pretty cool graphs, and then, and you, then you can print out a PDF report to give to the producer. Uh, this was made for dairies. And then a few years ago, we approached the University of Wisconsin and said, you know what? Uh, a cow-calf risk assessment is going to be a little different than, than a dairy. Would you guys, could we help you modify this app so that it works for cow-calf operations? And they were, they were gracious enough to let us do that. So uh, on this app, you can either select dairy or you can select cow-calf each time. 
and then work the Yoni's assessment. So in my mind, uh, without this, it's going to be really hard to control Yoni's on cow-calf operations, and, and it probably should be done yearly. And if you haven't, as a, as a practitioner, if you haven't done one of these before, we would be more than happy to, as a free service just to come out and, and work one with you and one producer, show you how it works, kind of go through the steps, and then, then you can do the rest of them on your own. So if you have any interest in that, just please give us a call. Areas of exposure, just quick in here, is that anything that uh, allows fecal contamination where these calves can ingest it is gonna be a source of exposure. Ponds and streams, there's not a whole lot we're gonna do about that. We just have to recognize that, that those are potential sources of infection. Uh, calving pens, if we've got cow-calf producers that are calving in small pens, it's important that we keep the fecal material from building up between animals as they go into those pens of the calf. And, and again, it's, it's manure management on these herds that, that's really important. And then feeding areas, we talk about if we're in a, if we're in a dry lot situation, we want, we would like to scrape that as often as we can to keep again, the adult cow manure from building up uh, in, those, in those places. And then uh, if we're using round bale feeders, every time we need to put a new bale in, we really would like that bale to be moved to a clean location because as they sit there, the, the cows defecate, the calves come up there and lay down, they get the feces on their hair, they self they may chew on something and they get infected. Um, some of these cows that are shedders, we call them super shedders, and they'll shed anywhere from 10,000 to 4 million colony forming units per gram of feces. And so they can contaminate an area very, very easily. They can't, these organisms can't replicate in the environment, but they can live in the environment uh, and they're pretty hardy. They don't like UV light, they don't like heat, and they don't like dry areas. But say in these barns back here where it's uh, shaded and there's moisture, uh, we can find live map organisms after all the animals are gone for many, many months. And in fact, some really neat research is, has been able to find it in manure lagoons for over a year and a half after all animals were moved completely off the facility. So again, they can't replicate, but they can they can live in certain environments. So we wanna make sure we, we keep the, the accumulation of that manure down to a minimum. If we're using bale processors or the bale unroller there at the bottom, uh, we advise that every time you feed the cows, move to clean ground, just move over a little ways. Again, that prevents those that cow, that adult cow manure from building up and those baby calves being exposed to it. Okay, we talked about the, the management side and then part of that is the biosecurity. So this is one of the hardest things to do is how do we keep yonis out of our herd? How do we not purchase animals? And, and our recommendation is, which is not, it's simple, but it's difficult, is for the producer before they buy replacements, whether it's heifers or bulls, ask the person they're buying them from, do you have yonis? Have you seen it? Uh, just be frank about it. And then ask them, are you on a control program? Uh, and if they, those two questions are, are appropriate or they're answered appropriately, then there's some steps that can be done to further uh, make sure that you're not purchasing the disease. Even if the owner says, I have yonis, but it's, I very seldom see clinical signs, I'm at a very low level and I'm on a control program, uh, by using this number three down here, it still gives you a lot of confidence that the animals that you're buying are, are not gonna be uh, positive or that you're gonna be able to find them before they become these shedders. So again, here, here's the, all the recommendations that are out there about biosecurity. Number one is obviously not recommended, no testing, but we recommend number three. So if this herd has a low level of prevalence or they believe they're negative, and they're on a control program, then just bring in the animals, the ones you wanna purchase, quarantine them for BVD and all the other uh, diseases that we're concerned about. But then either a lysa or fecal PCR, these animals just every year, that says six months or a year, we say every year, and it has to be done before calving season. Remember, we need these animals that are positive and shedding out of the calving uh, area uh, before calving so that they're not exposing the calves. So just doing that every year for, for three years, basically, that gives you a good idea, uh, very high confidence that these animals 
uh, you didn't bring in a positive animal. There's other, the other four and five and down there, I'm not gonna talk about those. Those are more complicated and uh, can certainly be more costly. I wanna get to the zoonotic potential. I don't know what the time is uh, for running late, but this won't take but a minute. That because of my interest in, in Yonis, I, I read a lot of scientific papers and I kind of gave up. I counted 200 scientific papers in the, in the last two years that mentioned MAP as a zoonotic potential. And as I said earlier, that uh, for a long time, there's been an association that said they're associated with, with Crohn's disease. There are uh, a pretty good high percentage of medical doctors that are studying Crohn's that have made the leap from association to causation. And as I told these folks yesterday, I, I came across a, an editorial in a European medical, human medical journal. And the title of it was from a guy that, that studies Crohn's disease and he called it human, human uh, Yoni's disease. And that just kind of struck me as they've made it from association to causation. But the rest of these diseases, they have made an association. Most of these uh, researchers will agree that from on the human side, it's not just the organism. There has to be a genetic predisposition on the human side and probably some immunosuppression, but there's more and more MDs that are believing that this organism is causing a problem in humans. And so one of the questions is, where is the source coming from? And here's the, here's the, the sources that are thrown out there, water. Uh, and people have looked at both recreational and both drinking water as, as a possible source. We know they're in these areas. Uh, some of these areas, they, we, we can find them in biofilms. There's real good research that shows that these organisms do live in amoebas that we can find in multiple uh, water supplies. Uh, milk, both raw and pasteurized, has been looked at uh, and found some, some organisms. Uh, red meat. And then again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, now there's a, a suggestion that people that are around uh, the MAP organization can actually inhale it through the, the dirt or their dust. And just real quick, here's a, uh, this is one study that was uh, 238 drinking water. So it was, uh, went through the, the sanitation plant. They didn't find any done it PCR positive. There's lots of studies that show it's not there and there's some that show it's there. I'm just giving you a couple examples. They, these people looked at different uh, tap water and it's 88% positive. And, and again, it's PCR positive. So we're not saying that they're viable uh, samples, but they definitely were there. Milk, uh, these researchers looked at 702 grocery store samples, multiple vendors, uh, used two types of culture and found almost 3% of the samples were culture positive, and then it was confirmed uh, with PCR after that. And then, and then beef. Uh, lots of studies have been out there in the United States and have not found it in our red meat. This particular one did. They looked at 50 different samples. They cultured it out of one. They actually took some red meat and uh, inoculated it with MAP and then cooked it. And you can see there at the bottom, they could find viable map organisms even after cooking. So I'm not trying to raise a flag and say this is a, a tremendously bad deal, but I do think that we need to start thinking about maybe trying to manage this disease both on the dairy and, and cow-calf operations. If nothing else, just to allay any fears that, that our food may not be uh, all that healthy. With that, I'd be happy to take any questions. We do have some questions in the chat. Awesome. Okay. Any thoughts on captive uh, cervidae? So elk, uh, is the clinical picture any different from cattle? Any any recommendations for best testing screening practices? Well, it, it is carried by elk and, and deer. We do know that. The presentation is probably more like sheep and goats, meaning the diarrhea is less prevalent. It's They're probably just emaciated. Uh, emaciation is what you see. We don't know. Uh, how much exposure our, our livestock have to, to wildlife. So we don't know if that's actually a source. Uh, it's, we're probably going to say no, that livestock are the reservoirs for livestock, but it's certainly in, a, in our wild cervidids. And are they also, do we believe their infection window is when they're young? That absolutely. They would, yes. Yep. So that, yep, absolutely. And that's true for sheep and goats and also for deer. And, and it has to do with 
the immaturity of the immune system, the, the gut still open, absorbing those antibodies and those kind of things. The best test, um, there aren't a whole lot of tests for species other than cattle, sheep, and goats. There is one test for alpacas, uh, but as far as wild wildlife, I don't know if there's any tests that are validated. Um, when Michael Collins was still at the Yonis Testing Center in Wisconsin, he told me that the vast majority of their samples that came in were from zoos and and uh, elk farms and deer farms. So uh, the testing can be done. We just don't have the capability. And that's the question was about captive particularly. Yeah, yeah, and I can see, yeah. Yeah. We probably ought to work on that. Somebody should work on that. Yeah, a diagnostic lab somewhere. What's your opinion about tissue PCR compared to fecal PCR? Uh, I think they're just, they're comparable. Uh, I don't know that anybody's shown that one sensitivity of one is greater than the other. Um, yeah, so I don't, I don't know if there's much difference at all. I haven't seen any difference in it, at least in the literature. How much emphasis do you place on the results of a single positive ELISA test in a herd with an unknown history of yonis? I put a lot of uh, faith in that it's positive, depending on where it is in the SB. If it's right close to the cutoff, then that could be a, a, a false positive. But if it's if it's up there in the in the higher mid range or even higher, then I'm going to put a lot of faith in it, even though they say that, that they don't have uh, yonis. And I realize there's cross reaction with with it. If in doubt, just retest, retest with a fecal PCR, or come back in a month or so and do another ELISA. When I was in vet school, we did a lot of. Uh, uh, embryo transfer on valuable cows that were yonis positive. So is that still a, a mechanism? It, is it, are, are you able to use em, embryo transfer as a mechanism? To Absolutely. Uh, it's been shown that if the embryo transfer, they're certified, if they're using their certified techniques, the, the risk of transmission is not going to be there. If they're, if they're flushing embryos out of positive yonis cows and they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, there's really no fear of transmission to that, to that embryo. If you had a pen that was occupied by a, a high shedder and now that animal's gone, is there a way to disinfect that pen? Uh, there really isn't any way to disinfect the pen. There, there are disinfectants that we can use on uh, waterers and, and pipes and those kind of uh, fomites. Uh, our typical sanitation uh, things do not work. So chlorhexidine, Clorox do not work. Uh, I've got a slide in there somewhere. There's three of the dioxides that actually work to kill this organism. But as far as the soil, there's really nothing we can do other than get the manure out there and let the sunlight and, and all that take care of them. Last question. Yep. If a producer bought three long yearling bulls from a reputable breeder and two out of the three developed chronic diarrhea and were ELISA positive at 1.8 and 2.2, is there any way to prove these bulls were infected when they were purchased? Unfortunately, no. And we, we deal a lot with that. You can't, I mean, we can say that the first six months or the first year is when they typically become infected, but because it is possible to infect adults, you're never going to be able to prove that. You're just not. Now, I think it's a good idea for the purchaser to contact the person they bought them from and say, just so you know, I've got a Yoni's positive animal here and you might want to think about your, your management program. All right. Excellent, excellent information, Greg. Thank you for Thank you. putting all that together. And we will see everybody in a month for our next diagnostic podcast. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Rush. Appreciate everybody.